Huh, <sighs> I hate the passage of time. It's been a year since I released the first part of my four-part video series on Doom 2016 vs Doom Eternal. These are by far the most popular videos I've created so far, and all I have to say is thank you to everyone who watched, commented, and liked them. I would also like to say that it's in spite of the fact that they are garbage, at least from a technical perspective. My first video was filled to the brim with audio issues, I didn't know how to properly transition images until the third one, and I also haven't found my narration voice yet, as evidenced by the fact that I used an incredibly stereotypical H-Bomber-style soft-talking voice, which I did by complete accident. I'd like to think I've gotten better since then, but that remains to be seen, I guess. One day I'd like to go back and remaster all four videos together into one, but I don't do this full time, so that project is really far off into the future. Regardless, something I am quite fond of is yearly traditions, and I like to start one now. As a sort of celebration of myself finally finding the courage to do YouTube videos, I'm going to dedicate every March to a video on Doom, for as long as I continue to do these at least. I'm not sure how many videos I can ultimately dedicate to one game series, but I'd like to reckon there's at least a decent amount considering it's Doom. I can cover the classic games from the 90s, Doom 3, or do what I'm going to do today, which is revisit Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. Despite having made up my mind about both games even before I did my video series, there were still some things I've yet to cover in both titles. I barely talked about the story, for one, and a lot of that is because I just don't ultimately care about diving too deep into the story of Doom. But that wouldn't stop me from doing an analysis at some point. I of course didn't even touch upon the multiplayer for both games, but there's a good reason for that. I don't really enjoy competitive multiplayer, so I'll never really talk about that. I also only touched upon my first impressions in regards to Doom Eternal's DLC, which basically amounted to the first level of the first part. So, yeah, that barely constitutes a review of it. I might pick up both parts of the Ancient Gods at some point, but I'm not prepared to at this point. Instead, what I want to discuss today is about the difficulty in both titles. Specifically their hardest difficulties. Well, technically hardest, but I'm not going to go into Ultra Nightmare. But you see, I remember seeing many comments about how Nightmare was the definitive way to play Doom Eternal specifically. I've personally never touched that mode on either title, but I kept seeing that sort of comment. And I have to admit, those kind of irked me. Part of it is the standard gatekeeping that I just despise when talking about difficulty in video games. It basically gaslights those who play on the other modes into believing they're either not good at the game, or just playing it wrong. It's the type of bro culture style response from a bunch of macho men who think they're tough because they're hardcore at video games. I know not everyone who commented is like that, but there is a prevailing sentiment on the internet that difficulty is the only measurement to a game's quality, and that's just not true. The thing is, it's just not the bro dudes who indulge in this sentiment. It's also been weaponized by the marketing apparatus of many game companies. I remember when The Witcher 3 was released, and how CD Projekt Red hyped up the Death March difficulty as the definitive way to play the game. At the very least, I can understand what they were trying to get at with that statement. It was the definitive way to play as a Witcher. Compared to the hack and slashing badass you normally experience in the other difficulties, Death March forced players to approach each encounter like a Witcher would, by utilizing every resource possible, laying traps, drinking potions, or what have you. But that's not how the marketing department phrased it. As a result, so many people took it to mean that it was the only way to play the game, and the other difficulty modes were just for filthy casuals. And there are countless other examples of this type of ridiculous marketing. When Deus Ex Human Revolution came out, for example, the game's hardest difficulty was called Give Me Deus Ex. Even at the time, when I bought into this bullshit about difficulty needing to be hard, I saw that as strange. How was I supposed to feel about playing the game on just the regular difficulty? Look, even though I'm one of those weirdos who argues that From Software can implement other difficulty modes into their games, at the very least, they do have a definitive way to play those titles. There isn't any gray area with them. But if there was a definitive difficulty to a game that has different modes, then it would either be the normal mode, because it's the game's baseline, or it doesn't have one at all. This segues nicely into Doom, because it serves as the perfect example. When the original game came out in 1993, there were only four difficulty modes, the hardest being Ultraviolence. Nightmare was only added after John Romero got fed up with the complaints he kept seeing on message boards that Doom was too easy. His entire desire when coming up with this new difficulty was to make the game as unfair as possible, as evidenced by the fact that the game actually triggers a prompt to tell you this when selecting it on the main menu. Nightmare on the original Doom games wasn't meant to be the ultimate, conclusive game mode for Doom. It was literally made to shut trolls up. 
I've not really played Nightmare in Doom 1 or 2. I've dabbled in it a few times, but it's simply not for me. It certainly lives up to its unfair reputation that Romero sought, but I will give the mode some credit. I don't think it's the definitive way to play Doom, but it certainly changes the way one approaches the game. The standard tactics one would use in something like Ultra Violence simply doesn't cut it on Nightmare. Being able to exploit the enemy to engage in things like infighting is a blessing with this mode, and novices will probably spend more time finding an optimal route to the end of each level instead of trying to explore every secret and corner. So despite being made to be as unfair as possible, the mode actually helps teach players to think differently about how they approach a game like this. That's the benefit of difficulty modes in general. Easier modes can provide a baseline and practice scenario to come to terms with the game's mechanics, level design, and combat. Harder difficulties can put a player's skill to the test by mixing things up a bit. That's what I always loved about Ultra Violence mode. It wasn't just a case of enemies having more health and doing more damage to you. Each level also increased the amount of enemies they had and mixed up what kind of demons you can come across. The slow, gradual pace of enemy encounters on Hurt Me Plenty is replaced by ones that constantly test your ability to know how to deal with the current situation. Would I say it's the true way to play the game? No, not at all. That really just comes down to the individual. Some people would be fine playing on any of the easier difficulties, and I won't ever take away their right to do so, nor would I ever frown upon them. But, if I do feel like being challenged, I would want that difficulty to be like what we see here. Changing up the level structure like this adds a new layer of replayability. If it was just the same encounters but with boosted damage, I don't think it would be as fun to play through. The challenge shouldn't come just in terms of raw hardness, but how one thinks about playing the game. Even though I'll never beat Nightmare in Classic Doom, I also understand why some people love it. It's not the true difficulty, but it's one that has a lot of appeal and for good reasons. This of course brings me to the modern Doom games. I've always preferred playing both on Ultra Violence. I've never felt tempted to play either version's Nightmare modes, but at the same time, I've played both so much that I can honestly say I've wanted a new challenge. So as a result, I finally decided to bite the bullet and play both games on Nightmare, and I managed to beat both games on this difficulty mode. Will I go on to play Ultra Nightmare as a result? Fuck no. But I do have some thoughts in regards to both games and how they handled their hardest difficulties, and which one I think did a better job in its implementation. Now, this really wouldn't have any effect on my overall thoughts on both games. Those stood pretty much intact even after completing this challenge. My love for Doom 2016's level design and exploration is always going to mean I preferred over Eternal. But after completing Nightmare, I can say I was intrigued by the similarities and differences between both titles. As a result, I wanted to continue my comparison series for just one more video, specifically comparing and contrasting these titles and their approach to Nightmare difficulty. I'll give a quick recap of my experiences in each level, my initial impressions, as well as my growing thoughts as I proceeded toward my destinations. And at the end, I'll answer the most pertinent question, which Doom did it better? So, without any further delay, let's continue this deep dive into Doom 2016 vs Doom Eternal, the nightmare experience. Before I get into my experiences though, let's first set some ground rules. First, I thought there was a way to turn off extra lives in Doom Eternal, but there isn't. I initially wanted to make the experiences as similar as possible, but since I can't turn them off, and the fact that I have a hard time resisting shiny objects, I did end up utilizing the extra lives, but there is a compromise there as I'll get into. I also reserved the right to go back to the previous levels to collect any secrets I missed, complete challenges, or easily master my weapon mods. However, in Doom Eternal's case, I didn't collect any extra lives when going back. I wanted to see how many of the 51 possible extra lives I maintained at the end. And yes, I know it's technically 52 lives, but there's an extra life on the final level that's just not there anymore. So that's why I said there's only 51. Now, despite the fact I wanted to make the experiences as similar as possible, that was never going to be the case. Despite the Doom Wiki making it sound like both Nightmare modes were the same, 
they simply aren't. The only thing they share in common is that the damage the Slayer takes is about 90% more than Hurt Me Plenty, and demons are generally a lot faster and more aggressive. But they take the same amount of hits to take down as they would in the other difficulty modes. But the big difference between 2016 and Eternal, however, is that health, armor, and ammo pickups are worth considerably less in 2016. On paper, this might not sound like much of a difference, but as I'll get into, this one little change completely affects how one plays 2016 but I'm getting ahead of myself. Like I said before, this section is mostly going to be a recounting of my experiences and feelings going through each game's levels. I will give some analysis when the time calls, but I really want to save that for the last section of this video when I sum everything up. The reason why I want to give just my feelings is because of how I had such a different experience with both titles. Both elicited completely different feelings in me that I couldn't help but notice. I'm not sure if this is a result of existing biases with both games, or just a result of their nightmare experiences specifically, but it was worth noting nonetheless. So again, without any further delay, let's get into the early game experience for both titles. So, I know one of the questions I'll be having to answer is, which game do I think is harder on Nightmare? Well, let's go ahead and answer that question right now. Oh my god! 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 Help me! Oh my god! You see this, everyone? This is why fodder demons exist in Doom Eternal. Doom 2016's Nightmare Mode is quite notorious for its early game difficulty, and it can all be blamed on these skinny creatures that had two spikes for nipples in the classic games. The imps in Doom 2016 are ridiculous, and it's all because of their damage output. Their standard fireball does 45 damage. That's almost half of the Slayer's health at this stage. The charged fireball does 75. This is the first real enemy you come across in the game. And no, I don't count the possessed. These guys are the main reason why I will never play this game on Ultra Nightmare. I can only imagine how many runs ended on this intro sequence alone. I knew how rough this section was just based on my experiences in Ultra Violence, so I had a plan to basically use this little room on the left to act as cover to draw each one out and blast them down with a shotgun, but that proved to be pointless. Because this is Nightmare, they are also a lot more aggressive with wanting to get close to the Slayer. Their melee isn't as strong as their fireballs, but they can chain them together, and because you don't possess any invincibility frames after receiving damage, that basically means instant death if more than one start waylaying on you. Once again, this is the intro sequence of the game. This is the very first arena you'll come across. The actual first level hasn't even technically started yet. I managed to beat it on my second try, but I felt really lucky on that attempt. My fear was that this was going to set the tone for the game, and I wouldn't be too wrong in that department. Once getting into the UAC proper, things don't change much. The soldiers aren't nearly as dangerous as the imps, but that's not saying much. Their charged plasma bolts can also do significant damage and have a large area of effect. Plus, they're also quite tankier. They are, however, a lot slower in terms of movement and reaction time, so they aren't as high priority to take down as the imps, who are much faster and harder to hit. The first arena is also not bad. It's nice and wide with plenty of paths to travel and gain distance on your enemies. Plus you also have a moment at the beginning to pick off the possessed that room around here so they don't get in your way. But as the level continues, the arenas become a bit more perilous. I basically took an approach of keeping my distance and utilizing the shotgun's explosive shot to easily pick off imps due to its decent area of effect damage. The biggest obstacle in this early stage is the low health we possess and the fact that armor is basically useless. It barely absorbs any damage, and there's no easy way to refill it. The beginning section laid bare what my priorities were when it came to upgrading my stats. But the problem is, I still have a whole other level to get through before I can start doing that. Doom Eternal, unfortunately, didn't really learn the proper lessons from 2016. Its first level suffers from almost the exact same issue, but in a different manner. Much like 2016, the Slayer's health is only 100 points, but at the very least, armor is more useful here because resource pickups aren't diminished in this mode. The beginning arena section during the intro sequence is significantly easier due to the game's rebalancing of its demons, so the imps and soldiers aren't nearly as much of a threat here because they're fodder demons. Plus, you get access to the Sticky Bomb mod for the shotgun right away, making easy work of these demons whenever they're grouped together. The problem with this level is that it introduces way too many dangerous situations too early that you're simply not well equipped for. 
The Arachnotrons and Cacodemons were already an issue for new players in Hurt Me Plenty, but it's the combination of these demons plus a swarm of imps and soldiers that made it feel like the game is expecting me to deal with all of them like I would any other arena in the game. But I don't possess my dash ability, I don't have the blood punch, and my resource stats are pathetic. I only managed to die once during one of these arenas, but it really felt like the game was terribly unfair despite me getting through it relatively unscathed. The one instance in the level that I got legitimately angry was this tunnel of death. Both games have traps, but Eternal felt like it really indulged in them, especially in the early game, which is just a dick move. This sequence here specifically, where you have to contend with these wall rockets and an Arachnotron, caused my first death and it really felt like it was just there to kill players after they attained their first extra life. My feelings after both first levels were one of trepidation. I was alarmed at just how unforgiving the difficulty was. Again, I knew how rough the early game was for both titles, even on lower difficulty modes, but I wasn't prepared for this. This wasn't so much a difficulty curve, but a difficulty cliff, and I was being pushed off it into a ravine of ravenous wolverines, honey badgers, and meerkats. If that's not a good enough visual for you, let me chart things out. Here's a chart that shows the typical difficulty in a video game from the beginning to the end, where the difficulty is ranked from 1 to 10. A typical game would do something like this. A simple and gradual struggle at the start, an escalation from the early game to the mid game, another gradual struggle, and then another escalation when transitioning to the end game. Seems pretty standard, right? Well, here are the charts for Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. In both instances, the hardest point in each title is near the beginning. This is bad because the beginning of the game is when the player is still trying to figure things out. The difficulty curve is simply a test of skill. Skill is always going to be worse at the beginning because of unfamiliarity, plus the relative lack of power the player character possesses. In both Doom games, however, not only are the hardest parts near the beginning, but both titles become noticeably easier as they progress. This is bad pacing, and it actually gets worse once we get to each game's second level. Resource operations doesn't start too bad. There are a few imp encounters at the beginning section, but most of the enemies are possessed who are really no threat whatsoever. The first arena section can be a bit daunting, but it's nice and open, so maintaining space isn't too much of an issue. One thing that became incredibly apparent is how careful I had to be when doing a glory kill though. Plenty of videos and strategy guides mention how glory kills are virtually useless on Nightmare in 2016, but I disagree. In the only parts, it's incredibly useful considering health pickups are rare and don't provide that much. But you have to be careful in your decision to glory kill. If there are other demons around the one that's staggered, it's best not to institute the glory kill as you'll simply be meleeed right after the animation's over. Gaining space is the key for this as it separates your enemies, so when one is staggered it's safer to glory kill them. This is also the case when using the chainsaw. It's an incredibly effective tool for gaining ammo in this mode, but you can't just use it whenever you want. Just like with glory kills, if you engage with it while other demons are around, you'll most likely be killed after you're done slicing your target in two. But that's not even the biggest worry here. The second arena in resource operations is the hardest in the entire game. You'd think it wouldn't be at this point considering it's just more soldiers and imps, which has been pretty consistent since the start of the first level, but that's where the arena design really comes into play. This one is cramped and filled to the brim with obstacles. I'm not talking about demonic obstacles, that goes without saying. I'm talking about structures. Doom 2016 really overindulged in this respect. Boxes, tables, consoles, it doesn't matter. The design of the game was really trying to go for a more lived-in space than the arcade stylings of Eternal. As a result, a good amount of my deaths in 2016 were the results of me running into something that hampered my movement. And at this point in the game, where I don't have a double jump, it made these moments incredibly aggravating. And of course, you still have those imps, which can easily melt your health away while you still only have the shotgun and 100 health. I died 5 times in this arena alone. I honestly felt like I hit a brick wall and my journey was going to be over before it even really started. I managed to beat it, but it really felt like it came down to RNG and nothing else. And as I have said a few times in other videos, if your difficulty is down to randomness, then it isn't a fair difficulty. It's just bullshit. Thankfully, things get a bit easier after this, as you'll get the heavy machine gun and the plasma gun in a secret. Simply having other weapons makes a world of difference considering the shotgun is really only good at close range. Now I have two weapons that can pick off enemies at range without needing to use the wimpy pistol. Plus, I was smart and decided to withhold using the weapon mod bots on the pointless charge burst and used it to get the micro missiles for the heavy machine gun. This mod was definitely the MVP of my run, thanks to its auto-aim capabilities. Whenever I needed something to deal with a 
annoying imps throwing fireballs at me, this was usually my weapon of choice to deal with them. Much like the Chainsaw and Glory Kills though, the Berserk power-up is actually a bit dangerous here. It can launch you into a Glory Kill much quicker, but dodging incoming fire is tricky, especially since you can't use any of the weapons. Shielded soldiers remain chainsaw bait, at least in this level, and the end of the level presents us with the first Argent Cell upgrade. This is where strategy came into play. I knew at this point that armor was virtually useless, so my biggest need was health. Getting up to at least 150 was the goal, and then I could start considering taking ammo upgrades. Overall, this was the hardest level in the game, with my most deaths in a single level out of both 2016 and Eternal for me. Exultia, by comparison, was actually a lot easier for me. In fact, I didn't die a single time during the level. I did forget two of the locations for extra lives, so that will affect the total number of deaths I'll have to calculate at the end, but that's for future me to figure out. Honestly, the hardest part for me was the beginning section before getting the dashes. Once I got that, dealing with the Hell Knights and arenas in general was just a lot easier. On top of that, you get the flame belt at the beginning, which is vital for maintaining armor. Your first sentinel crystals to increase your health and armor, your first rune, which I used on mid-air control, and the blood punch, which is great for staggering heavy demons or easily dispatching a group of fodder for some health. Basically, you end up getting a lot more resources and abilities at your disposal into the game's second level compared to 2016. The only thing I really had to consider is whether I would do the optional gore challenge nests and slayer gates. Ultimately, I decided it wasn't worth doing them unless I thought they were easy enough. I did go back to complete the challenges in this level later to complete the Super Shotgun Mastery, but for the most part, you get plenty of weapon upgrade points just by playing the level and finding secrets. I completely skipped the Slayer Gates until the end of Terras Nabod, and as I found out, they were pretty much pointless endeavors anyway. For the most part, there isn't much for me to say in regards to this level. The environmental hazards are a pain, but besides the purple slime, they're pretty harmless. But yeah, the slime parts suck, especially when the level throws a cacodemon and an arachnotron in your way. I don't get the purpose of the purple slime in this game. Only a few levels utilize it, and its only purpose seems to slow the pace of the experience down. But compared to resource operations, this was complete breeze. And now we enter the cliff part of both games. Whereas the first two levels of both Dooms made me feel like I was being thrown to the wolves, the third and fourth levels made me feel like this was the actual beginning of each title. It's incredible what a few extra weapons, abilities, and upgrades can do to dramatically alter the difficulty. This is by no means a compliment, as I'll explain in the summary section, but it's nice not always have to wonder if a simple arena will result in multiple deaths. The Foundry is a nice change of pace as a result of not just this, but also because it's the first non-linear level in the game. Granted, if I wasn't as familiar with the level as I am, I probably would have had a much harder time, but this is about my experience, and I knew exactly where I wanted to go and how to deal with each obstacle. The result is a level where my only deaths were technicalities due to me trying to jump across the lava section and failing because you lose momentum on this platform, but I will count these as deaths nonetheless. The big change with the Foundry is the introduction of two new enemies, the Hell Knight and the Hellraiser. You'd think introducing new enemies would make the game harder, but it doesn't. Because there are now more enemy types that can spawn in a given arena, that means there are less M's to contend with. This is the main reason why the game gets progressively easier. The first two levels were infested with M's that made my life an absolute pain, and without the proper weapons or upgrades to deal with them, they constantly killed me. But Hell Knights? They're simple in comparison to the Imps. They're meat shields, of course, but their attacks are easily dodged. They tend to spawn by themselves or in a group of two. Yeah, I forgot one did kill me, but that was due to a weird glitch where I clearly had it set up for a glory kill, but I ended up just meleeing it instead, which woke it up from its stagger state. Really, going forward, the Hell Knights are more notable for being my chainsaw targets more than anything else. The Hell Razors can be a bit dangerous because of their laser beams, but they're easily dispatched by micro-missiles at range or an exploding shotgun blast up close. At this point, my biggest concern was figuring out what I wanted to do with weapon mods and Praetor tokens. The first thing I prioritized with the tokens was environmental immunity. Quite a few of my deaths in the early stages were because of exploding barrels, so the quicker I could become immune to those and my own explosion attacks, the better. As for the weapon mod in this level, as much as I wanted to save it for the charged burst on the rocket launcher, the stun bomb on the plasma rifle is just too necessary for survival not to take it. I'll get into my methodology for weapon mods later, but the early portions are pretty simple. The explosive shot is too good for controlling groups of weaker enemies, the micro-missiles, as I mentioned before, are perfect for long-range auto-aiming, and the stun bomb is just perfect for getting mobs of demons off you so you can create distance. Plus, it's absolutely vital for dealing with pinkies later. 
Getting the rocket launcher early in a secret meant I had a much easier time dealing with the final arena. This goes back to my video on both games' level design, but I just love 2016 for this reason. It actively rewards you for exploring each level for secrets, whereas most of the rewards for secrets in Eternal are just really pointless. At most, they just provide you with suit tokens, and that's it. I'll have more to say about this in a little bit, though. Overall, yes, I died a few times in the Foundry, but none of those were really my fault. They were just the result of bad glitches in physics. The actual challenge was a lot more manageable and fun as a result. Cult of Space was also a nice change in pace compared to the first two levels in Eternal. Yes, I didn't die while playing Exultia, but I still had to be a lot more careful during that level than here. My only death here came in the arena before the introduction of the Whiplash, but compared to Exultia, there aren't a lot of areas that hindered my ability to move around. There are a few cramped arenas, but they're actually pretty generous. The one in the pit, for example, summons a few cube balls for you to use against anything that you would deem a massive threat, like the Mancubus. But for the most part, the arenas are just nice open spaces with plenty of jump pads for getting distance. My strategy for tokens, weapon upgrades, and runes was a bit of a mixed bag. My first rune was obviously mid-air control. But with the second rune, I focused on getting the speed burst at the glory kill. This one obviously makes a lot of sense. Being able to quickly move about an arena to separate demons is incredibly key to survival. I withheld using any of my weapon tokens, however, as I wanted to save them for the super shotgun. Mastering that weapon is key due to its mastery providing armor tokens, but my choices in suit tokens was probably a mistake. I decided to focus on upgrading the freeze grenade first, because I figured I would use it a lot. That didn't end up being the case, though. Looking back, I should have focused on upgrading my dashes, it's more important to maintain speed in arena sections. I managed, of course, but it was a mistake nonetheless. And much like the suit tokens, I should have focused on the two that refills the blood punch with enough armor and health pickups. The combination of glory kills and the flame belch basically would have meant that the blood punch would have remained filled at all times. Ultimately, though, the thing that stands out a lot at this point in Doom Eternal is that it feels like I'm simply playing the base game, but on a harder difficulty. Sure, I'm applying strategy to what I'm prioritizing in terms of upgrades, but my overall combat strategy hasn't changed at all. I'm still prioritizing the same enemies when it comes to kill order, I'm still using the same weapon mods for each gun, and I'm still using the same runes I've used on all other difficulties. Compared this to what I said earlier about 2016, I had to approach encounters completely differently in that game because resources are at a premium. Glory killing with no regard to your surroundings can be a death sentence, and my priorities in kill order are completely different here than in lower difficulties. The only strategy that's remained the same for me is using Hell Nice as ammo caches, but that's pretty much it. Sure, Doom Eternal is harder at this difficulty, but harder doesn't necessarily mean the challenge is different or better. And as I'll continue forward, this will eventually start to grate on me. Whereas I was completely taken aback by how Doom 2016 forced me to rethink the way I was playing, Doom Eternal hasn't provided that challenge so far. As a result, there isn't much for me to discuss in terms of level experience. It's just the same involvement that Cultist Base normally provides, just a bit harder. Heading into the Archon facility, I was left to wonder what was exactly ahead of me. I know this level pretty much inside and out because it's one of the best in the game, but considering I was taken aback by the Foundry, I was prepared for anything. One thing that was starting to become incredibly apparent was the lack of ammo. Again, because resources are worth a premium in Nightmare, this meant I was forced to utilize more of my arsenal. As a result, I actually ended up using the rocket launcher a lot more even before I managed to get the weapon mod. Normally, I wouldn't pay much attention to it as using the combination of the micro-missiles and explosive shot was enough to take down Hell Knights. But since I needed to use those mods and other demons, I actually needed the firepower the rocket launcher provided at this point in the game. I still didn't really need to use the frag grenade, but it did come in handy from time to time to deal with shielded soldiers. The big obstacle about this level, however, is that a few of the arenas in the upper sections are a bit cramped. But thanks to the fact this is a non-linear stage, I was able to take advantage of the fact that I could simply fall back down to a lower area that was spaced out better. I was still having the weird glitch where I couldn't glory kill Hell Knights, so that was inconvenient. But thankfully after this point, they spawn a lot less, which means that they just become chainsaw food. Much like with Eternal, once I got access to the super shotgun, I made sure to use every weapon token I had to max it out and spent time going back to previous levels to complete its mastery. Also very similarly to Eternal, I am using pretty much the same weapon mods I normally would. Right now, it is feeling a little bit repetitive, but as we progress, this becomes less of an issue. Something I haven't talked about, however, are the skill challenges. These are necessary to get weapon points to improve your guns. In the other difficulty modes, I usually had no issue trying to complete each one, but that becomes more perilous on Nightmare. Each level usually has at least one challenge involving glory kills that I just did not feel comfortable even attempting, due to the fact that glory killing is so much more dangerous in this mode. Mode. Thankfully, the game is still pretty generous in rewarding weapon points, so I never felt pressured to complete all of the challenges. 
In the end, there really isn't much for me to talk about in the Archon facility. It felt a bit samey in comparison to the lower modes, but the challenge is still there. I'm still having to be much more cognizant about my surroundings during arena sections, and it's nice to see the Hell Knight actually being a threat, even if it's for the short term. Overall, my experience so far has been one of dread that's turned pretty quickly toward fulfillment, and I can't really complain about that. Going into Doom Hunter base, I also don't have much to talk about. I went back to the first level to complete the mastery of the Super Shotgun, which is pretty overpowered if I'm being honest. Between it and the Flame Belch, it's difficult not to have armor at any given point, which is quite the contrast to how Doom 2016 feels. My only death in this level came as a result of me being dumb and trying to get too close to the Doom Hunter, and then getting caught on a wall. But other than that, I have absolutely nothing to say about this level. It also plays out pretty much the same as it normally would, but again, just a little bit harder. Normally in the mid-game is when things start to ramp up just a bit, and I'd have more to say, but that's not the case with the Argent Tower. For one, I only have footage of the last third of the level because the first two parts didn't record. Even then, there wasn't much to write home about. It's still the Argent Tower. It sucks. The main campus gets introduced, and is high on the kill order's results. In fact, imps are starting to fall in terms of priorities. Outside of summoners who are always at the top whenever they appear, imps are really only a priority if there's a group of them. Outside of that, the Mancubus is higher priority due to how high damage their attacks are, and the next level introduces an even higher priority demon. My only death that I managed to record was a weird one when I was trying to get to a room trial and was somehow squashed by a cargo rail. There are also a few cramped areas where shielded soldiers are located. By this point, however, I've learned that a well-placed explosive shot or frag grenade deals with them pretty well. They're no longer chainsaw targets like they are on lower difficulties because their shotgun blasts do a lot of damage up close. From far enough distance, though, they're whips. Also, this level introduces the most essential item towards survival, the hologram. This will be my equipment choice going forward for obvious reasons. But yeah, outside of those few points, I don't have much to say about this one. It's the Archon Tower after all. This level is highly linear, it's overindulgent and bad platforming, the secrets suck, and it's incredibly long too. It's the one level that really doesn't feel like anything has changed from going from ultra violence to nightmare. Even though I didn't have much to say about the Archon facility, it still kept me on my toes. This is the one level where I didn't feel challenged, at least in the way Nightmare has been so far. By comparison, Super Gordness is a nice change of pace with Doom Eternal, and it's not just because it's just an awesome level normally. This is one of the few levels, I feel, that tries to do more than just arena-to-arena -arena encounters. Much like with the Yarshan Tower, there are some hallways that are a bit cramped that act as a good test for my reflexes, as it forces me to deal with certain enemies like Whiplashes, Mankubai, and Dread Knights up close. The arenas are fun, don't get me wrong, but it feels like a good chunk of the game only knows to do arena counters. These brief battles just help with the level's pacing, and are certainly better than the forced platforming sections. They're no replacement for good secrets and exploration, but still, I take these over Eternal's normal tricks. The buff totem sections are also enjoyable, with the caveat being that they can both be completed pretty quickly if you know where to go. The only real annoying section is the part after getting the blue key, where you have to contend with acid, tentacles, and a mancubus. Really, it's for the tentacles more than anything else. I really despise these things because they can do a surprising amount of damage, are difficult to know where they'll pop up from, and they only get worse during the self-destruct sequence at the end. Still though, I didn't die in this level either, but I really chalk that up to the fact that I played this one more than any other level in the game. I love Super Gore Nest, so I know all of its ins and outs. I'm sure if I had played this on Nightmare when I was still fresh to the game four years ago, I would have struggled a bit more. Speaking of struggle, here comes Kanigir Sanctum. I only died twice in this one, but this was a tricky level. Not only is this the level that introduces Khaki Demons, which supplant Imps as my number one target for now, but it also introduces Lost Souls, which can be especially deadly if you aren't prepared for them. My first death was actually the result of an arena that spawns two summoners. I simply forgot about the fact that there were two, so I let the second one to go continuously spawn Hell Knights that harassed me. My second death was to the aforementioned Lost Souls, when I forgot they spawned in this arena with the Barons of Hell. You'd think that I had this level memorized considering how many hours I put into Doom 2016, but apparently that's not the case for me. Luckily, this is also the level I added Siege Mode to the Gauss Cannon, so that decreased the threat of Mancubi and Kanka Demons by a considerable amount. Kakos are still the highest threat whenever they spawn in an arena due to their damage output, straw melee, and the fact that they cause a blur effect whenever they do hit you with their projectiles. Imps can still be quite dangerous, but with my health and ammo considerably higher now, they aren't nearly the threat they once were. Now, as far as runes are concerned in 2016, I of course went with midair control for one of them. 
Heavy maneuverability is just too valuable, especially in Doom 2016. I simply lack all the movement tricks that the Slayer possesses in Eternal, but using something like the speed boost at the glory kill isn't as useful in 2016 because of how less frequent I attempt at glory kills. My second rune slot went to ammo boost though, for obvious reasons. The only time I would fiddle with these was during boss fights since an ammo boost isn't really helpful when you don't have a chainsaw target. The thing that's becoming apparent at this point, however, that I've pointed to before, is how I'm actually using most of my arsenal. There's a rhythm in 2016 on Nightmare that doesn't really exist on Hurt Me Plenty or Ultra Violence. Most of the time in my other playthroughs, I would just spam the Super Shotgun a lot, while occasionally switching to the Explosive Shot, Micro Missiles, and Siege Mode. But here, I am using my Plasma Gun for more than just a stun bomb. It actually does significantly more damage than the Heavy Machine Gun, so if I'm running low on ammo, it's a decent replacement for picking off weaker enemies. If you compare this to Eternal, I've actually abandoned some weapons. The regular combat shotgun is pretty much useless by the midpoint. The Arbalist is much more effective for dealing with Cacodemons than the Sticky Bomb due to the fact that I don't have to wait for the Cacodemon to enter its stagger state. And as we'll see, I rarely ended up using the Chain Gun. I know it's useful for its Shieldmon and Ultra Nightmare, but I just felt like it slowed me down regardless of the weapon mod I was using. And that's not even getting into the most disappointing weapon in the game, but more on that later. Sure, I didn't really end up using the chain gun much at first in 2016, but that's because I hadn't gotten the mobile turret yet. But it is worth pointing out how I am actually going through most of my arsenal here, and a lot of that has to do with how much more situational they are in this game. The explosive shot for the combat shotgun helps deal with weaker enemies in packs, and micro missiles are great at picking off weaker enemies at range. The plasma gun is a great overall weapon that deals decent, consistent damage, plus its stun bomb is just great for survival. The super shotgun is just a fantastic weapon in general, and makes quick work of several tankier enemies at close range. The rocket launcher has two great mods for dealing some serious damage, and the Gauss Cannon has Siege Mode. Need I say anything else on that gun? On top of that, I'm actually running out of ammo pretty consistently. This is despite the fact that each weapon has a larger clip in this game than Eternal, and all of that has to do with the Chainsaw. The Chainsaw in 2016 is a lot more situational. Sure, I could waste it on weaker enemies like Imps and maintain more ammo, but there really is no point. Because you can carry up to 7 charges for it, that means you can use it on any enemy outside of Lost Souls and bosses. As a result, there's a strategic element to using the Chainsaw. Like I mentioned before, I prefer using it on Hell Knights mostly because they only require 3 charges. And it eliminates an annoying enemy that's mostly there to harass you and take your attention away from more dangerous demons. On top of that, by playing your cards right, you can also save your charges to deal with a more powerful foe like the Mancubus or Baron. However, in Doom Eternal, the Chainsaw only really serves to refill your ammo when you get low, and having only a maximum of 3 charges limits your potential targets. And because ammo is already so low to begin with, its best targets end up being fodder demons. There's also no sense of strategy into using it since the first charge always refills. If you get low on ammo, just find the nearest fodder demon and you're good, as those demons are in abundance in each area of the level. As a result, I never really felt like ammo was an issue in Doom Eternal. There's more skill in trying to maintain health and armor in comparison. The irony of the situation is that it reduced the base ammo of each weapon to try and force players to switch them more. But this change to the chainsaw results in the opposite effect. Since ammo is almost always freely around, you can simply stick to a few weapons and refill it whenever it gets low. That's why I rely on the Super Shotgun so much. On top of its mastery being quite handy for survivability, it's just an all-around great weapon since it does reliable damage. The only other weapon as reliable as it is the scope for the Heavy Cannon, and even then, its use is much more situational under the Super Shotgun. Yes, once you get the hang of quick swapping between guns, your arsenal becomes a lot more useful, but that's only really good at focusing on just a single target. When there are so many demons to contend with in a given arena, trying to constantly swap between your different weapons can actually slow you down. As such, I almost always found it more useful to just be patient, run around a little, and then just charge a burst of rockets into a demon's face. The results are the same even if I'm not doing it as quickly. Plus, as I'll get into, there came a point where the barrage of demons started to make the mere act of swapping between weapons a chore. Before I can get into that though, let's quickly recap my experience in Arch and Facility Destroyed, as there really isn't much for me to talk about. The big thing to note in this level is that it introduces the revamped Pinky Demon, and I love him even more in Nightmare. Granted, that's not saying a lot considering he was my favorite enemy in the other difficulties as well. Compared to Eternal though, Doom 2016 isn't afraid to throw a few Pinkies at once in an Arena. And because the stun bomb can't realistically freeze every one of the beasts, this is the moment I started to heavily rely upon the hologram. It's kind of funny considering I barely used any equipment items on Hurt Me Plenty or Ultra Violence. But once again, Nightmare on 2016 is forcing me to use every resource I have at my disposal. 
One of the difficulties I definitely had in both games was deciding what to use as my third rune. I ended up using the armor on Glory Kills rune in 2016, but it wasn't exactly handy. It only really provided just a little bit of protection that would get wasted quite easily. I knew I wasn't going to use the Rich Get Richer rune considering I had so much trouble maintaining armor to begin with, so that one was out of the question. Equipment power also didn't make a lot of sense because it really didn't seem to affect the hologram that much. That rune really seemed tailor-made for the siphon grenade more than anything else. Looking back on it then, my only good options for the third rune were Vacuum and Savagery. Even then, they don't provide the tangible benefits that Ammo Boost and In-Flight Mobility do. My only death in the level came at the beginning, when I was pincered in this corridor area during a secret hunt. So even though I complained about the traps in Doom Eternal earlier, there are a few of them in 2016 that I just don't appreciate. For the most part, the game doesn't indulge in these a lot, but there's an odd one here or there when secret hunting. I get trying to keep players on their toes, but secrets to me should just be about the reward. Punishing a player for exploring could have the unintended consequence of making them reluctant to hunt secrets. But overall, this is a fine level and really serves to ramp up the challenge for 2016 as I transition to the advanced research complex. But for now, I have to talk about Arc Complex. This is the moment I really started to churn on Doom Eternal's Nightmare Mode. On top of just not feeling any sort of new experience while playing it, this is the level that accentuates a problem with many of Doom Eternal's second half. Incredibly cramped arenas that last a lot longer than they should. For the first time since, at least, when I had my initial troubles with the game when I first played it upon release, I was beginning to think the combat was bloated. I've always said that the combat can be divisive, but incredibly rewarding once it all clicks, and any issues I had with my brain shutting off at times during battle because of too much fighting and poor pacing. But I really started to see the other argument during this level. Again, I only died once here, but it came during the arena section I think embodied this feeling. This section in the restaurant goes on forever. Endless demons in an incredibly cramped arena with no verticality to it whatsoever just drove me up a wall. And the fact that it's followed by another, admittedly shorter arena section doesn't help things. But one arena section doesn't ruin the whole level. I get that they made this level with the intention of being like you're in a city, but we experienced that in Super Gorgonus too, but it had plenty of space to get ground on your enemies. Many of these arenas are just so cramped that it feels almost impossible at times to avoid damage. Add how busy the screen can be with demons at any given moment, and I can understand why my brain shuts off at times during combat. There are too many mechanics to memorize for the demons, and too many systems to have to contend with as well. I have to constantly juggle between flame belching enemies for armor, blood punching and glory killing for health, chainsawing for ammo, sniping the Mancubus's rocket launchers off, freezing pinkies in place to shoot them from behind. Plasma gunning riot soldiers, simply dealing with carcasses, me hooking enemies to get away and get more armor, and what have you. I think I tolerated this on the lower difficulties because the margin for error was lower. But here, this is a nightmare. No pun intended. It's the fact that this is the same as Ultra Violence but much harder. The pressure to complete it while not dying makes it so much more stressful, and not in a good way. It's not help that this level also overabuses the purple slime again. Seriously, I don't understand this game's fascination with this stuff. It was one thing to have to contend with it in Exultia, but retreading it was so tediously pointless. I take back what I said in my level design video. Our complex is a lot worse than Candy Gear Sancta. At the very least, I didn't have to wait three minutes in two different elevator sequences in that level. I never want to hear about how Doom 2016 wastes time with those boring exposition moments with Samuel Hayden again. Yeah, they're not great, but at least they're not a long elevator sequence while being completely frozen. I don't understand why these weren't just part of the skippable cutscenes. Speaking of boring exposition, it's time to quickly recap Advanced Research Complex. This level was quite the milestone for me. It's the first Doom 2016 level I completed on Nightmare without dying a single time. A lot of that is a result of me finally utilizing the hologram more, as well as finally getting the BFG, but it's also down to the arena design. Some of these arenas are the largest in the game, featuring 3-4 to four layers to them. This means it's quite easy to maintain separation, which is incredibly vital in this game due to the increased difficulty in dodging attacks compared to Eternal. The level also just doesn't have a lot of tricks up its sleeve. It's one of the most straightforward areas in the game. There are really only three major arenas with a lot more smaller encounters and cramped hallways this time around. Outside of the traps getting to the BFG, it also doesn't really try to trick you in any sort of way. The only really dangerous section of the level is this platforming section going from the cargo area to the complex itself. You have the lost souls that patrol here, and the only real trap with a caco demon that greets you after obtaining a supercharge, but even then, I'm so familiar with it that it's really easy to deal with. Honestly, the most dangerous moments in the level is to jump to the lever to open the secret retro room. I almost screwed it up but still managed to survive. But yeah, outside of all that, 
there's not much to say here. It's a rather short level that seems to be taking things a little easier before the difficulty gets ramped up with a boss fight in the next level. Up next for Doom Eternal, however, is... <sighs> Mars Core. I don't know what to say about Mars Core, to be quite honest. Outside of the first real big arena, this is such a nothing level. The Doom Hunter killed me again, and it is proving to be my biggest adversary, but outside of that, I never felt like I came close to being challenged. Even the Doom Hunter near the end isn't as difficult to deal with because there are plenty of jump pants around for me to maintain distance. Outside of that, though, it's just Mars Core. It's a set of linear set pieces and platforming bits segmented by dull arenas. The BFG comes in handy a few times to deal with a couple Baron encounters, but that's really just it in terms of this level's tricks. Even the tentacles are no threat considering they aren't obscured under slime. I'm kind of honestly at a loss for words, but that's because this level gives me nothing, so I might as well just move on. The end game for both Doom titles can basically amount to a boss rush. Granted, there are actual levels that are tied to those boss encounters, as well as traditional levels in between, but the big obstacles for the endgame for both titles are these bosses. First up on the plate is Lazarus Labs in Doom 2016 and the Cyber Demon fight. The level itself is more noted for its cramped arenas. The one in the lab with all the dissected demons gave me the most trouble, but again, I learned pretty quickly to rely on the hologram to save my life. If not for that, then this arena would really rake up there with the second arena on resource operations as one of the hardest in the game. Thankfully, I only died twice here but still the most I've suffered in a single arena since the beginning of the game. I also encountered a really strange bug in the final arena before the Cyber Demon fight. For some reason, the demons partway through just stopped moving after being spawned. They would attack me if I got too close to them, but otherwise remained stationary. I won't complain about it since this is a bug that was to my benefit, but it was strange nonetheless. Then there's the main event, the Cyber Demon. I can't begin to tell you how much I love this fight regardless of the difficulty mode. It all comes down to the fact that the boss is designed specifically for a one-on-one -on -one encounter. So the Slayer's strengths and weaknesses are taken into account in regards to the boss's mechanics. The only issue with this boss, and subsequently all bosses in 2016, is how overpowered the BFG is in the encounter. This means it's really easy to just rush the boss down, especially if you get lucky with the ammo boost rune, as it can cause the boss to drop BFG ammo. I didn't use that rune, and as we'll see, there was a good reason for that. Mechanically though, the boss is just a treat. Pretty much every attack can be dodged, so long as you know how to react to them. The standard rocket barrage is pretty well telegraphed and the easiest to figure out. The back mounted rockets are intimidating, but also pretty easy to avoid so long as you keep moving. And the entry blades are pretty simple once you get the pattern down. The most dangerous attack, however, is the demon's tracking blast, as it requires you to reposition yourself the moment it locks on. It's the one attack that basically requires you to stop moving and be patient but precise once you do start moving. The big thing with the Cyber Demon is that if you aren't careful and get hit by him, his attacks are pretty devastating. His Energy Blade attack is especially deadly as a direct hit can effectively one-shot you from 100 health. Technically, the boss did kill me right at the end with this attack, but since I switched to using the saving throw rune, it didn't count. Hey, if it doesn't count on Ultra Nightmare, I'm not counting it here. So because of this, I can understand why rushing the boss down is so effective. Trying to get into an elongated fight where you're constantly having to contend with his attacks can lead to a quick death based on a simple mistake. And yet, I'm fine with that. It just means that if I do fail, that's on me. He rarely chains attacks together too, which means his difficulty is pretty fair. In direct contrast to the Cyber Demon, however, is the Gladiator. I was pretty harsh on him in my original video series, and I do have plenty of criticisms, but he is the best boss in the game, especially in the second phase. The problem is just how tedious certain aspects of this fight are. First are the ads. As I mentioned in my original video comparing the combat between both games, I didn't like this aspect. It was necessary due to the overall changes in Doom Eternal's combat, but this is an example of bloat that feels like it was just done to pad out the fight more than add complexity. I really despise the first phase, however. It's basically just a game of peekaboo if I'm being honest. You're just waiting for the gladiator to flash a green light before you blast him in the eyes with a ballista shot. The only thing done to mix up this phase are the ad spawns. This is done to purposely take your eyes off the gladiator in an effort to get you to multitask his attacks and the ad attacks. But that's the issue. In order to add complexity, the devs didn't mix up the boss's mechanics at all. They just relied on the mechanics of enemies you've already been fighting. The only attack the boss has in this phase is his mace swing and shield projectile. If you compare this to the first phase of the Cyber Demon fight, it's night and day in terms of just a pure interaction with the boss. This is such a lazy and boring encounter at the beginning. 
The second phase is much better, but can still be quite tedious due to the Gladiator over-relying on his spinning mace shield to block incoming damage. But he is a lot more aggressive and a lot more deadly during this phase. Thankfully, this is much more of a standard one-on-one -on -one encounter as well, as the only adds that spawn are on Willing, who are simply there to restore your resources. My biggest challenge was dealing with his waving energy blades. The erratic movements of these things kind of feel cheap to me. I just haven't really practiced them a whole lot. Maybe I can get used to them, but I'm not sure when that'll happen. Overall, the boss is a mixed bag because of how bad the first phase is, but the second is a lot better. He's a solid C+, in a game where the other major bosses are mainly Fs. Terrace Nabod is normally my most hated level in Doom Eternal. The cramped arenas, the awful swimming sections, the boring puzzles, the awful enemy placement, and the annoying secrets, all of it results in the most aggravating section of the game for me. So of course, I beat the level without dying a single time. I think the difference between this and Mars Core is the fact that I actually remember sections of Terrace Nabod. It's so frustrating it's kind of hard to forget it, you know? As a result, I'm quite privy to its tricks, so I was able to survive without much issue. Mars Core, by comparison, is so boring and forgettable that it goes by as a blur for me. The biggest obstacles here are two Marauder encounters and two Archfile encounters. The Archfiles are no issue as the BFG makes quick work of them, but the Marauders are a different story. I didn't bring up the one at the end of Arc Complex because there wasn't much to say. It's a pretty easy encounter considering there aren't many adds outside the Possessed, and the arena is pretty small. Which for any other demon would be bothersome, but is actually quite advantageous when dealing with the Marauder. The two and Terrace Nabata are a different story though. In the case for both, it comes down to the fact that you have to contend with other demons while also dealing with Marauders. The first encounter isn't too tough. Just make sure to quickly kill the Kaka demon, and then just juggle the Marauder's attacks with the other fodder demons. The second one is a little trickier due to the fact that there are heavier demons to contend with, specifically a Dread Knight, some Prowlers, and a Whiplash. Making sure to deal with the Dread Knight and Whiplash first is vital before tackling the Marauder. The Prowlers are a perfect example of why I don't understand why there wasn't another demon category between Fodder and Heavy. They're too much of a pushover to be classified the same as a Hell Knight or Mancubus. This kind of goes back to my point about the chainsaw. Something I mentioned was that you can carry up to three charges, and I've honestly never understood this because all heavy demons require three charges to kill, while all fodder demons require just one. So why bother with three charges then? Just cut it to two. There's no benefit to having the extra charge considering the first one always recharges. Had there been a demon category between fodder and heavy, it would have made a lot more sense why there would be three. Two charges would be used to take down medium demons, and three would be reserved for the truly heavy ones. On top of that, there would have been some strategy to this. Say something like the Whiplash was in the second category. They're a dangerous enemy on their own, but it would force players to consider whether using two charges on it would be worth it if they could reserve another charge for a Mancubus or Cyber Mancubus. I don't know. Again, I just have problems with the chainsaw in general in this game, and I don't want to get too hung up on it. But yeah, like I said before, I managed to get through Terrace Nabob without much of an issue. Outside of the Marauders, there's a good section in the middle where you also have to be a bit careful when killing fodder demons, as there aren't a lot that spawn, and there aren't a lot of ammo pickups either. This is something I remember back in my playthrough last year, and I took note of it. If you kill two indiscriminately, you'll lose your only resources for regaining ammo. I kind of like this because it forces players to actually use more of their arsenal. Fodder demons are so easy to abuse because of the chainsaw. Had they done something like this more throughout the entire game, I think it would have actually made the changes they made to the combat a bit more compelling. It also means they would have had to think a lot more about demon placement in arenas a bit more for balance, which is why it probably didn't happen. Instead, we're just left with the chaotic mess that we got. Titan's Realm was the second Doom 2016 map I managed to beat without dying a single time on Nightmare. Despite a few traps and fakeouts, this level doesn't really have anything cruel to it. It's really just the Pinky and Mancubus showcase, especially Pinkies. I love fighting these scenes in 2016, but this level really went over the top with them. This level also introduces the Siphon Grenade, which I think I tried once and promptly never again because the hologram is just so much better. Demons hardly stand around long enough for the Siphon to work properly in my opinion. This is a good level overall, but doesn't have some of the more balls out arenas that the last three levels possessed. So it was kind of a breeze. Okay, this is where I made a huge mistake in Doom Eternal. I figured I'd take this moment to go back and complete the Slayer Keys for the Unmaker. For the most part, it was pretty simple considering the early levels were no match for an upgraded Slayer. My only issue was getting to the last Slayer Gate in Terrace Nabod, which resulted in me dying twice. The issue is that those deaths weren't worth it. The Unmaker just sucks. I used a bit in the lower modes, but it has no place in Nightmare. It's basically just a single target VFG, which is already problematic considering the Crucible Blade is the same thing. But also, 
What's more efficient, a giant fuck-all blast that can clear an entire room of demons in an instant, or a high-burst plasma gun that can quickly kill a single target? Yeah, the answer is the BFG. The Unmaker is the worst weapon in the game, and it wasn't worth the time and lives I spent to get it. If this thing operated like it did back in Doom 64, it would have been one thing, but id really neutered it in the Eternal. Such a disappointment. Okay, let's speedrun the rest of the loaves and leave the bosses for the end. There's not a lot to get into after all. First, Necroval. Both parts are just kind of annoying more than anything else. I only died in one of the indoor arenas in the first part, and I chalked that up to the obstacles and traps littered throughout the arena, but also just down to fatigue. I was ready to be done with Eternal at this point. Both levels aren't all that inspired anyway, so I was mostly just bored for the remainder of the non-boss encounters outside the final level. The Necropolis. Mostly just a boring level with not a lot of tricks up its sleeve like it is on the other difficulties. I died once because I got caught between a Spectre and a Mancubus. Always remember to use a hologram whenever possible. It's a literal lifesaver. Other than that, it's pretty forgettable outside the boss fight. Erdak. The penultimate level in Doom Eternal, and yet it doesn't really feel like it. There are a few tense arenas, and I did die twice in the process, but for the most part, this is just a regular level. Maybe I was still just in a... I'm done with this mindset? Or maybe the unsatisfying boss fight deflated me a bit afterward. But this level really only has the one nonlinear moment in it to hold itself up. Otherwise, it was just a nothing experience. Vega Central Processing. Now, this is a penultimate level. Several large arenas where the game is just throwing everything at you, especially that final arena. This was tense, and the crazy thing is the game really didn't do anything like this previously. Sure, there were some tense arenas before, but most of that was the result of not having the Slayer leveled up. But here, this is truly a test of skill after everything you've collected and upgraded. Really, what this proves is that it can have incredibly long, drawn-out arena sections that are incredibly tense, when they've properly built up to it, instead of just having the entire game be like that. Argent Denur. A bit of a letdown after Vega. The arenas aren't as balls to the wall as the ones in the previous level. It makes me wonder if they could have just trimmed these sections to a single one and just focus on the boss fight. It definitely feels like an afterthought in comparison to the rest of the game in this respect. And finally, Final Sin. This level sucks because of the boss fight. Had it not been for that, these arenas more than satisfied the itch I didn't get out of Erdak. Unfortunately, these long arena sections are tied to a terribly long, awful boss fight that ruins the rest of the experience. I'll have more to say on that in a minute, though. Oh, brother. The difference in boss quality between both games is staggering. I was a lot kinder to the Gladiator this time around, but I will not be in regards to the other two bosses in Doom Eternal. Starting first with the con maker, who just plain sucks. And for one good reason. She's way too easy. I don't know why it took me so long to figure out that the lock burst for the rocket launcher melts her shield, but once I did, this fight was an absolute cakewalk. The brief moments I got close to dying was simply as a result of that awful The Floor is Lava gimmick. Really, the issue is the fact that her mechanics don't change up at all. It's the same thing over and over for six rounds. Dodge her attacks, Rocket Burst her, Meat Hook and Blood Punch her, gather resources from the Maker Drones, and then focus on the Con Maker again. I guess I appreciate how brief this whole encounter is. The rest of the game has a pacing issue, with things dragging out much longer than necessary. But there could have been some degree of challenge here that isn't cheap bullshit with the floor. Maybe this was the result of the fact that the next level was going to have the opposite issue with its boss, not to mention the fact that it's two levels with bosses back to back. But this is such an uninspired fight with such an easy exploit. And then there's the Icon of Sin. Oh boy, the Icon of Sin. This is the worst boss in Doom's existence, and that's saying something. This is somehow worse than the original Icon fight. At least that one is simple and can be completed relatively quickly. This version is so long and drawn out when it didn't need to be. The mechanics are just as simple as the Con Maker. All you have to do is just shoot the different sections of his body off, but in between all of that is this cavalcade of infinitely spawning demons that can either screw you over if the wrong ones spawn, or a complete non-factor if you get lucky. I've said this before, but if part of the difficulty of an encounter comes down to RNG, then it isn't a well-designed fight. The biggest issue is with the arena design. Phase 1 is in such a cramped area, with not a lot of room to move around and avoid the Icon's attacks. And because of that RNG, I kept getting swarmed with some of the most dangerous enemies to contend with as well. The result is so much useless padding before I could even get an attempt to attack the Icon, and his attacks are just straight up bullshit. He telegraphs his attacks pretty well, but they take up such a large space that they're still hard to avoid. His punches in particular have a gravitational effect, 
where it can draw you in, even if you simply get clipped by it. My best course of action was to try and blitz down his lower sections with the BFG, and try my best to deal with his upper sections when I could. I died three times in this phase alone, and none of them felt remotely like they were my fault. The second phase by comparison was a lot easier, and it's all because the arena is so much more open and the icon doesn't really attack with his fists. It still doesn't change the fact that this is a painfully slow battle where I could only muster a few attacks within a 5 minute window because of all the ad spawns. This didn't feel like a test of skill or even of patience. This is actual bloat. This is petting out a boss fight because the devs couldn't come up with anything different. Just do the same thing for two phases and call it a boss fight. If it weren't for the RNG bullshit and unfair mechanics, I'd call this a boring fight because there isn't much to it. Instead, it's a giant clusterfuck that is incredibly unrewarding to accomplish. The 2016 bosses, by comparison, are so much better. For one, again, they're just one-on-one -on -one encounters. The only one that mixes up slightly are the Hell Guards. Even then, it only doubles the amount of enemies to two. The first phase is right up there with the Cyber Demon from before. He's a mixture of aggressive and sometimes passive, but that's all tied to the phase's unique gimmick with the shield. My strategy doesn't really deviate from my standard one in the other difficulties. I just use my trusty Super Shotgun whenever his shield does go down. It's really just a factor of time. The shield doesn't stay down for long, so the Super Shotgun is the only weapon that can dish out quick, reliable damage in those moments. Once he's stunned, however, that's when I pulled out the Chain Gun's mobile turret, which was incredibly effective. Phase 2 is where I ended up cheesing things. I had my BFG ammo saved, so I blasted off three shots of it right at the beginning which took off two-thirds of the boss's collective health bar. Then it was just a simple matter of spamming the hologram and going to town on both of the Super Shotgun. Ultimately, this was a pretty easy and disappointing end to the fight considering the first phase was a lot of fun. But as I mentioned before, this is an issue with 2016's bosses. The BFG is just too damn strong in these encounters. Had they had some sort of mitigating factor like the Gladiator and Comaker shields, then it would have made things better. It would have forced players to actually engage with the mechanics. That being said, you still have to be careful when you use the BFG, considering its limited ammo pool, but it's an issue nonetheless. The Spider Mastermind had my heart pumping before I even entered the arena. I know how tough this fight is on just hurt and plenty, so I was well prepared for a slobber knocker. The hardest part of this fight, however, is finding her proper hitbox. Aiming at her face doesn't do a lot of damage, it seems. Instead, you want to aim for her brain, specifically the top of it, at least as far as my experience goes. Obviously, Siege Mode is the MVP weapon of this encounter, but it's also simple to just spam the BFG. With the Ammo Boost rune equipped, it meant that I got a few extra charges whenever I blasted her with it. In comparison to the Hell Guards, however, her attacks definitely hit harder. I got a little close to dying near the end, but she ultimately couldn't continue to handle the deadly combination of Siege Mode and the BFG. Ultimately, she can be viewed as a bit of a disappointment. If your luck is right, you can easily blitz her down, but I love how fast and frenetic she is. She feels like an appropriate challenge at the end of the game. On top of that, like the rest of the bosses in 2016, she doesn't overstate her welcome. She's not padded out for the sake of it because the devs knew mechanics or where difficulty and challenge lie. It was so discouraging to see them take such a massive step back in this regard in its sequel. Both the Gladiator and especially the Icon of Sen feel like they thought if something was long, that meant it was harder. But that's not the case, it just means the encounter is bloated. You can certainly do a multi-phase, complicated and difficult boss encounter, but it requires engaging mechanics. When all you have to do is just spam the player with ads while the boss does the same three attacks over and over, that isn't engaging. It will instead range between cheap and boring and those problems were only exacerbated on Nightmare. Because hell, hell is for children. So how am I going to sum everything up? What are the parameters in which I'm going to determine which game had the better Nightmare mode? Well, I think it comes down to three specific criteria. Which one was harder, which one was fairer, and which one made me adjust my combat approach. The difficulty question isn't as simple to answer as you'd expect. Sure, I said that Doom 2016 was harder earlier, but that was more of a joke. On the whole, I did die far more in Doom 2016 than I did in Doom Eternal, but most of those deaths were front-loaded toward the beginning of the game. By the midway point, I was really only dying once a level. Doom Eternal, by comparison, was a bit more consistent in terms of deaths. The most I had in any given level was the first phase of the Icon fight at the end, where I died three times. But I don't think it's a great statistic to go by when determining difficulty. Plenty of my early deaths were because of glitches or some weird oddity. Remember the three deaths I experienced in the Foundry? All three really shouldn't have happened. 
Two were on a platform I clearly should have been able to make, and the third was the result of a glitch where I couldn't glory kill a Hell Knight. None of those deaths were my fault. I really should have ended the level with zero deaths, and those aren't the only ones I experienced that were like that. So simply tallying my failures and saying the one with a higher body count really isn't going to cut it on this question. So what do I think determines which game is harder? Well, I think it comes down to two specific questions. Which game did I struggle the most to get used to on this difficulty, and which one did I find had the most consistent challenge? For both games, there was an early game difficulty spike. In Doom 2016's case, it all comes down to those damn imps. They're so overtuned to damage output that it's just pure ridiculousness. This goes beyond just nightmare difficulty. This is a problem even on normal. It kind of feels like someone made a mistake when coding and were too afraid to admit they screwed up, so they just kept it in. Instead, they just waited until the sequel to rectify that error. Once I got some health upgrades and a few new weapons, the imps did become less of a danger, and by the midway point of the game, they weren't spawning in large groups anymore, so they really became a non-issue. Doom Eternal's early difficulty was a different problem, however. It simply felt like the game was expecting me to play by its normal rules before I had all my abilities to really deal with it all. It was especially rough before I got the dash because enemies like the Hell Knights are incredibly fast and aggressive. It's manageable, but both games really start off too hard right out the gates. And again, this isn't just an issue of Nightmare. I remember having this exact same problem back when I first played this on Hurt Me Plenty. This is not how you teach people to play your game. In both cases, the fix is relatively simple. Doom 2016 needed to retune the imp, and Doom Eternal just needed to introduce the dash much earlier on level 1. Both would have made those early sections a lot more fair, which I'll get to that subject in a moment. In terms of consistent difficulty, this one is a bit tricky to answer. Both games had levels I breezed through pretty much unscathed, and others where I struggled a bit. Both used traps in various locations, and both had challenging arena sections. The big difference between the two, of course, are the abilities at the Slayer's disposal. In order to avoid damage in 2016, you have to utilize a lot more distraction abilities like the Stun Bomb and the Hologram. This is all because resources are at a premium with how little ammo, armor, and health pickups give you. Doom Eternal, meanwhile, maintains the resource management of the lower modes, but amplifies how quick and aggressive enemies are. So, honestly, my answer is a bit of a cop-out. They're both pretty even, I think, in terms of raw challenge. They both have a consistent element that remains the same throughout the journey. Resource management really adds a whole new layer to getting through 2016, and trying to remain calm under constant pressure and internal is key to winning. Both of them ramp things up as the campaign progresses, and both have similar peaks and valleys in terms of their difficulty curves. But raw challenge doesn't get to the core of each game's difficulty. That's where we get to the subject of fairness. As I already mentioned, both games have what I consider to be an incredibly unfair early difficulty spike. When I can honestly say that the first few levels are harder than the last few, there is a major balancing problem. And it's not an issue of the last few missions being only slightly less challenging than the first. No, the later parts of each game can actually be quite easy due to power creep. In both games, you have so many resources and powerful abilities at your disposal that many fights feel incredibly tipped in the Slayer's direction. However, there is a key difference between the two approaches. Both games require you to consistently manage your resources, but they approach it in completely different ways as I have already discussed before. But it's because of this difference that I managed to figure out which had a fairer difficulty. Doom Eternal assumes you'll always have the means to regenerate health, ammo, and armor. As such, the devs had no real issue cramming arenas with as many enemies as possible, and this is to the game's detriment. The constant need to juggle between various abilities to survive and weapons to exploit enemy weaknesses is cathartic, I'll always say that, but it doesn't mean it's implemented with grace. There's a strong lack of understanding how various demons can sync with one another in terms of abilities. So many are thrown out seemingly at random that it feels like it's meant to induce panic in the player more than anything else. The result is a challenge that feels much more artificial than natural. 2016 by comparison feels like its arenas are designed around both good symmetry with its demons and the knowledge that the Slayer doesn't have as many resources at its disposal. This could be a bit of projecting on my part, I admit that. I'm much more intimately familiar with 2016's levels compared to Eternal because I've played them more. But there's also truth to that matter. Objectively, you don't have as many means to regain health, armor, or ammo. As a result, you have to be more careful in your approach to each area regardless of where you are in the campaign. If it approached its arena's design in 2016 in a similar fashion to Eternal, it would have been impossible. Ignore something like the dash and lower ammo. I'm just talking about adding in a ridiculous amount of enemies into 2016's arenas. If every arena were like the one at the end of Vega Central Processing, no doubt I probably would have quit. But thankfully they aren't. They are designed around both the Slayer's strengths and weaknesses. Same thing with the bosses. Because they are purely one-on-one -on -one encounters, the devs couldn't get too cute with them. As a result, each boss has attacks that are designed to be dodged with the Slayer's base speed, 
whereas Eternal's bosses each have additional enemy spawns that add frustration instead of complexity. So it should be obvious that I think 2016 is a lot more fair with its difficulty despite many of my early game gripes. As for the final criteria, I think that should be pretty obvious by now. Doom 2016's Nightmare Mode made me completely rethink my approach to combat. I couldn't rely as much on glory kills to keep me in the game. I instead had to be much more strategic about when I could safely do one instead of simply spamming the F button whenever I saw a glowing demon. Chainsaw management was also a major aspect, considering it could be a very powerful tool if you're patient. As such, I was actually much more willing to swap between weapons in 2016 compared to Eternal, and I actually used my equipment items this time around instead of ignoring them like I do on the other difficulties. Doom Eternal, by contrast, is just more of the same. Nothing really changes between Ultra Violence and Nightmare outside of just pure difficulty. As such, I got incredibly bored and jaded by the time I finished Arc Complex. I gained nothing by playing on Nightmare. It changed none of my perspectives of the game, and was unrewarding as a result. I'd much rather there had been an option to disable extra lives, so I felt like there was an actual danger in Ultra Violence, then I would rather play Nightmare with the extra lives enabled. In the end, that really just sums up my entire experience with both Nightmare modes. I knew this experience wasn't going to influence my overall thoughts about both games, but I was left kind of shocked how it actually strengthened my argument for Doom 2016 being better than Eternal. I can actually see myself replaying Nightmare games get better at it in 2016. I'd have to ignore the early game issues, but both games suffer in that department. This is just another example that less is actually more instead of more being more. The simplistic nature of Doom 2016 that rewards exploration is what brings me back to it every few months or so. This just adds another excuse I have to reinstall it whenever I need a good first-person shooter to occupy my boredom. I appreciate Doom Eternal, but this was an experience I don't ever really want to revisit. In the end, this just reinforces my thoughts with both games. I love both, but I now know what experiences I prefer for each. Hey everyone, thank you to all who have made it this far. If you liked or disliked the video, you know what to do. I'm not going to beg you to support me the way I want you to. But if you did enjoy this video, I do hope you can at least give one of my other non-Doom related videos a try. But until next time, my name is Glan, I review games, and I look forward to seeing you all again.